Welcome back. In this video, you will learn how to find the area of surfaces of revolution with polar equations. Let's get to it. All right, so, so far we've used calculus within the polar coordinate system to find slope, area, and arc length, and now we want to use calculus to find the area of surfaces of revolution within the polar coordinate system. Now we've already calculated area of surfaces of revolution within the rectangular coordinate system, in particular when those surfaces are formed by revolving curves around an axis that were represented by rectangular equations or parametric equations. And so before we look at how to calculate area of surfaces of revolution formed by polar curves with polar equations, I want to go through a quick refresher on how we calculated area of surfaces of revolution in the rectangular coordinate system. So if you take a look at this graph right here, here we are working within the rectangular coordinate system. We have our x-axis and our y-axis, and then we have a curve that is represented by a rectangular equation. We have y equals f of x. And now what we do with this curve is we form a surface of revolution by taking a particular section of that curve, an arc length L between two values of x, A and B, and we revolve that part of the curve around either the x-axis or the y-axis. In this particular graph right here, we are revolving this curve around the x-axis. And so between those two values of x, when we revolve this arc length around the x-axis, we form this surface of revolution that I have drawn right here. And when we wanted to calculate the area of that surface of revolution formed by revolving our curve around the x-axis, we used the following formula. The surface area was equal to 2 pi times the integral from a to b of r of x times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. All right, now r of x in this integral is the radius in terms of x for our surface of revolution. Essentially what it is, is the distance between our curve and the axis that we are revolving around. So when revolving around the x-axis, the radius is the distance between the curve and the x-axis. And that vertical distance is just going to be dependent on whatever function represents your curve. And so for this curve, that would be f of x. All right, and so this is how we calculated the area of a surface of revolution when revolving around the x-axis, but we can also revolve this curve around the y-axis, and that involves a different formula. If you take a look at this graph, I have the same curve that we worked with over here, but instead of revolving it around the x-axis, we are now revolving it around the y-axis. And so when you revolve this section of this curve between a and b, the same arc length, around the y-axis, you form a different surface of revolution. And so it's most likely going to have a different surface area. And we calculate that area with this formula. The surface area is equal to 2 pi times the integral from a to b of x times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. It's practically the same exact formula that we have over here when we're revolving around the x-axis, except the radius of our surface of revolution is different. When revolving around the x-axis, the radius was r of x, which is just going to be f of x, right? And r of x is just the distance between our curve and the axis of revolution, which is the x-axis. But when revolving around the y-axis, the distance between the curve and this axis of revolution will be different. The distance between the y-axis and our curve is just a distance of x. Wherever we are along this curve, the distance between that point and the y-axis is just whatever value of x we are at along the x-axis. And so the radius is x. That's really the only difference between these two formulas for calculating area of a surface of revolution within the rectangular coordinate system. All right, and so that's how we calculated area of surfaces of revolution in the rectangular coordinate system. But before we look at how to do this within the polar coordinate system, it's important to understand what these two formulas are doing. How are they actually calculating the area of these surfaces of revolution? And what these two formulas are doing is adding up the circumference of an infinite number of circles between the two values of x, a and b, that dictate the part of the curve that we are revolving around either axis, right? If you were to take a look at this graph right here, when we are revolving around the x-axis, if you pick any point along this curve between a and b, and revolve it around the x-axis, you're going to create a circle. This surface of revolution has circular cross-sections. So if you want to calculate the area around the outside of that surface, you just have to multiply the circumference of a representative circular cross-section in terms of x 
by the arc length of the curve that you're revolving around the axis, right? So the general idea is this, the area of the surface of revolution is equal to the circumference of a circular cross section times the arc length of the particular section of the curve that we are revolving around the axis. And we know that the circumference of a circle is equal to two pi r or two pi times the radius. So that looks like this, we'll have two pi times the radius r and that's still multiplied by the arc length. Now, depending on what axis you were revolving around, that radius might be r of x, which is f of x, or it might be just x. All right, but in either case, two pi r times the arc length of the curve is what gives you the area of the surface of revolution. And so the way we get from this idea to these two formulas is to remember that the arc length of a curve in the rectangular coordinate system can be calculated using the following definite integral. The arc length is equal to the integral from a to b of the square root of one plus f prime of x squared dx. All right, and so replacing L in this formula with this definite integral is how we form these two formulas. Of course, then we include the radius within the integral because the radius is in terms of x in either case. The value of the radius depends on where you are along the arc length, and so it's important to include that within the integral. All right, and so that's how we get these two formulas for calculating area of a surface of revolution in the rectangular coordinate system. But now we can finally apply this same process within the polar coordinate system for polar curves represented by polar equations. And so if you take a look at this graph right here, you can see that we are working within the polar coordinate system. We have our polar axis and our vertical axis of theta equals pi divided by two. And then we have this curve represented by polar equation, r equals f of theta. And we're taking a particular section of that polar curve, which is an arc length of L between two angles of theta, theta equals alpha and theta equals beta. And we have this same graph over here. The only difference is the axis that we are revolving our curve around to form a surface of revolution. In this first graph, we are revolving around the polar axis or an angle of zero. And in the second graph, we are revolving around the vertical axis, the angle of pi divided by two. All right, now when we revolve around the polar axis, our surface of revolution will look something like this. It's not a perfect drawing, but you kind of get the idea of the shape here. We can take any point along this arc length and revolve it around the polar axis to create circular cross sections that form this surface of revolution. And then we can do the same thing over here, but revolve this curve around the vertical axis. And so that will look something like this. Once again, not a perfect drawing, but you get the idea. That's the general shape of our surface of revolution. And so if we wanna calculate the area of these surfaces of revolution, we can use the same process that we used within the rectangular coordinate system. We can use this concept that the area of the surface of revolution will be equal to two pi times the radius, times the arc length. But in order to do that, we need to know a couple things. We need to know what the radius would be in each case. We need to know what the radius would be when revolving around the polar axis and what the radius would be when revolving around the vertical axis. And then additionally, we also need to know the arc length of our polar curve between those two angles of theta. Once we know what the radius and the arc length are equal to, we can set up a formula in each case that will calculate the area of the surface of revolution. And so let's start with our first graph here when we are revolving around the polar axis. When revolving around the polar axis, the area of the surface of revolution will be equal to two pi times the radius times the arc length. Now, what will the radius be in this case? Well, the radius is going to be the distance from our curve to the axis that we are revolving around, the distance between our curve and the polar axis. And so what would this distance right here, the radius, be equal to? Well, in the polar coordinate system, we typically don't measure vertical distances, right? We measure a radius, which is a distance from the origin, and we measure an angle, theta, from the polar axis. And so at first, it seems a little bit difficult to accurately represent this vertical distance. But what we can do is make use of some of those conversion formulas that we used when converting between the polar coordinate system and the rectangular coordinate system. Because what this distance would be is some value of y, right? The distance from this curve to this axis would be a vertical measurement of y. We usually measure y vertically and x horizontally. 
So we would say that that's represented by y, but we know from our conversion formulas that y is equal to r times sine theta. The radius, or whatever r is equal to in terms of theta, times sine theta. So the radius of our surface of revolution in the polar coordinate system when revolving around the polar axis will be r times sine theta. All right, so that will be our radius of our surface of revolution. And I just wanna make it clear that this r right here is not the same as this r. They are different r's. This r just represents the general radius of our surface of revolution. And this r corresponds to the function that represents our polar curve. All right, so I just wanted to make that clear. Not that there's any confusion about what r is equal to here. All right, but then before we can finish setting up our definite integral or this formula to calculate the area of this surface of revolution, we need to know the arc length of our polar curve. And in a previous lesson, we found that the arc length of a polar curve is equal to the following definite integral. The arc length is equal to the integral from alpha to beta of the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared times d theta. So what we can do is use this definite integral for the arc length of our polar curve and combine it with our radius of our surface of revolution to form a definite integral that will calculate the area of that surface of revolution. Just remember that we will need to include this radius within the integral because it's also in terms of theta and that radius is dependent on where you are along the curve. It is not a constant value. It needs to be within our integral. So here's what we'll have. To complete our formula, we'll have s is equal to two pi times the integral from alpha to beta of our radius r times sine theta times the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared d theta. All right, and so this r is the same as this r. It's our function of theta that represents our polar curve and dr d theta is the derivative of that function. All right, and so this right here is the formula or the definite integral that we can use to calculate the area of a surface of revolution formed by revolving a polar curve around the polar axis. But now let's find the formula that will calculate that surface area when our surface of revolution is formed by revolving around the vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two. When revolving around theta equals pi divided by two, the area of the surface of revolution will be equal to two pi times the integral from alpha to beta, but then our radius is going to be different. All right, we're still using the same arc length. We have the same curve, the same arc length. We're just revolving it around a different axis. Instead of the polar axis, we're revolving around theta equals pi divided by two. So the radius is the only thing that's going to be different. And the radius is always the distance between the axis of revolution and your curve. So in this case, that is this distance right here. And similar to our radius over here, when revolving around the polar axis, this radius is a horizontal distance, which really isn't a common measurement within the polar coordinate system, right? Once again, within the polar coordinate system, we measure a distance from the origin to our curve. That's our radius. And we also measure an angle of theta. We don't really measure vertical distance and horizontal distance. All right, but that horizontal distance, the distance between this axis and our curve, we could represent with x, right? Just like y is a vertical measurement, x is a horizontal measurement. And we know from our conversion formulas that x is equal to r times cosine theta. That is what x would be equal to in terms of theta. So our new radius when revolving around theta equals pi divided by two will be r times cosine theta. That is the radius of our surface of revolution. And then the rest of this formula will be the exact same as this formula. We're just going to fill in the rest of our arc length integral. So we'll have the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared times d theta. That is the formula or the definite integral that we will use to calculate the area of a surface of revolution in the polar coordinate system when revolving around theta equals pi divided by two. Okay, and so to summarize what we just found, the area of surfaces of revolution in polar form can be found with the following two formulas or definite integrals. When revolving around the polar axis, the area of the surface of revolution is equal to two pi times the integral from alpha to beta of r times sine theta times the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared d theta 
but then when revolving around theta equals pi divided by two, you will have the same exact formula, but the radius will change from r sine theta to r cosine theta. So really the only difference is that you have cosine rather than sine. All right, and so now that we have these formulas, let's take a look at some examples of calculating area of surfaces of revolution formed by polar curves. All right, so here's our first example. We wanna find the area of the surface formed by revolving the curve represented by the polar equation around the polar axis. And our polar equation in this case is r equals sine theta. Now, if you're familiar with the graph of this polar equation, r equals sine theta, it looks a little bit like this. If this is our angle of zero and then pi divided by two, pi and three pi divided by two, r equals sine theta is a circle that rests above the polar axis. All right, and so what we're doing in this case is revolving this curve or this circle around the polar axis. And so we're revolving around this axis right here. This is the equivalent of the x-axis in the rectangular coordinate system. All right, so we're gonna be calculating the area of the surface of revolution formed by revolving this circle around this polar axis. All right, and so let's set up our definite integral. The area of the surface of revolution will be equal to two pi times the integral from alpha to beta of r times sine theta, right? We're going to use sine theta because we were revolving around the polar axis. If we were instead revolving around the vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two, then we would have r cosine theta. But in this case, we're not. We're revolving around the polar axis, so we're working with sine. And then that will be multiplied by the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared d theta. Okay, so to set up this definite integral, we need to know what r is equal to, which we have right here, r is equal to sine theta. And then we also need to know dr d theta, the derivative of r with respect to theta. So we'll find that in just a second. And then we also need to determine our bounds of integration. What two values of theta does our curve lie between? Now, typically for these problems, you'll be given a range of theta values to work with. In this case, they're not given a range. And so that means you're gonna be using the entire curve. And so if you look at our graph here, this circle for r equals sine theta, that lies between an angle of zero and an angle of pi. So our range of theta values will be from zero to pi. So we're gonna be integrating from zero to pi. All right, so we have r and our angles of theta. Now we just need dr d theta, which is the derivative of r with respect to theta. And so the derivative of sine is cosine. So that means that dr d theta is equal to cosine theta. All right, so now we have everything that we need to set up our definite integral and calculate the area of this surface of revolution. So let's plug everything in. This will be equal to two pi times the integral from zero to pi of r times sine theta, and r is equal to sine theta. So we're going to have sine theta times sine theta times the square root of r squared. Once again, r is equal to sine. So we're going to have sine theta squared and then we're going to add that to dr d theta squared, and dr d theta is cosine theta, so we'll have cosine theta squared, and then d theta. All right, and so if we solve this definite integral, we will find the area of our surface of revolution. All we have to do is simplify it and solve it. And so let's work on simplifying this. First thing that I notice is that sine theta times sine theta will be sine squared theta, and then these two quantities, we can square them. Sine theta squared is sine squared theta, and cosine theta squared is cosine squared theta. So this is equal to two pi times the integral from zero to pi of sine squared theta times the square root of sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta d theta. Okay, so now that we combine sine and sine to be sine squared theta and we square these two quantities, what we wanna do is look for ways to make this integral simpler so that we can integrate it. And so if you take a look at what we have here, there's actually something really nice that we can do to simplify and have an easier integral to solve. Notice that we have sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. We know from one of our Pythagorean identities for sine and cosine, that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to one. So we can replace sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta with one, and we'd have the square root of one, which is just one, so we're multiplying one by sine squared theta. So really what we have here is two pi times the integral from zero to pi of sine squared theta d theta, right? We're just multiplying sine squared theta 
by one, and so we just have the integral of sine squared theta. Okay, and so now we have a much simpler integral to work with. In fact, this is a trigonometric integral that we learned how to solve earlier in calculus two. When you have sine squared theta, you can integrate that by rewriting it using another trigonometric identity. And so let's work on that next. We know that sine squared theta can be rewritten using a half angle identity, specifically that sine squared theta is equal to one half times one minus cosine of two theta. And rewriting it in this way will allow us to solve this integral. So this will be equal to two pi times the integral from zero to pi of one half times one minus cosine of two theta d theta. All right, and now this one half can be pulled out to the front. We'll have one half times two pi. This two and the one half will cancel out. Two times one half is just one. So we're just gonna be left with pi on the outside of the integral. So this is equal to pi times the integral from zero to pi of one minus cosine of two theta times d theta. Okay, and so now we can integrate this pretty easily. The integral of one is just going to be theta, and then the integral of cosine of two theta is going to require u substitution, but a pretty easy u substitution. We just need to set u equal to that inside function since cosine of two theta is a composite function, right? We have a function of two theta within another function of cosine. All right, and so since we have to use u substitution for this term, I'm going to split up this integral into two integrals so that we can work on integrating each of these terms separately. So here's what that will look like. The area of the surface of revolution will be equal to pi times the integral from zero to pi of one d theta minus pi times the integral from zero to pi of cosine of two theta d theta. We subtract this integral because this term is negative. All right, and we have to keep that pi in front of both integrals. Now, if we use u substitution for this, we're going to set u equal to two theta which means that du d theta is equal to two. That's the derivative of u with respect to theta. The derivative of two theta is two. And then if we multiply both sides by d theta, we'll have du is equal to two times d theta. And whatever du is equal to, we need to be able to find that within our integral. But I don't see two d theta, I just see d theta. So we want to divide both sides by two. So we'll have du divided by two is equal to d theta. And now we have a term of du that can replace something that we can find in our integral. All right, so we can rewrite this integral in terms of u, but first let's integrate one. As I said earlier, the integral of one is just going to be theta. So we'll have theta evaluated from zero to pi, and then we will subtract pi times the integral from theta equals zero to theta equals pi of cosine u times du divided by two. All right, now I wrote our bounds of integration in this way, theta equals zero and theta equals pi, so that we remember that they are bounds of theta. All right, so if we wanna rewrite our integral entirely in terms of u, we also need to convert our bounds of integration from being in terms of theta to being in terms of u. And all we have to do to do that is plug in these values of theta into the equation for what we set u equal to. So when theta equals zero, we'll have two times zero, which will give you zero. So the lower bound will be u equals zero, so I'm just going to rewrite that. We'll have u equals zero. And then for the upper bound, theta equals pi, we'll have two times pi. And so u will equal two pi, and that will be our new upper bound. So I'll rewrite that. We'll have u equals two pi. Okay, so now our integral is entirely in terms of u. And so we don't have to go back into terms of theta. We can just integrate and evaluate in terms of u. Okay, and so, we can evaluate theta at pi and subtract the evaluation at zero. That's just going to be pi minus zero, which is pi. So this is equal to pi times pi. And then we will subtract this integral. And I'm gonna pull one half to the outside. So we'll have one half times pi, which is pi divided by two. And then we can just integrate cosine of u. The integral of cosine is sine. So we will be multiplying by sine u evaluated from zero to two pi. But now sine of two pi is zero and sine of zero is zero. So we have zero minus zero. And so this just becomes zero times pi divided by two, which is just zero. So we have pi times pi minus zero, which means that our final answer will be pi squared. This became zero. So our final answer is just going to be pi squared. Okay, 
So pi squared is the area of the surface of revolution formed by revolving r equals sine theta, this circle, around the polar axis. So that was an example where our surface of revolution was formed by revolving around the polar axis, but now let's look at an example where our surface is formed by revolving around the vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two. All right, so here's our second example. We wanna find the area of the surface formed by revolving the curve represented by the polar equation around theta equals pi divided by two. In this case, our polar equation is r equals six times cosine theta, and we are revolving the particular part of the curve represented by this equation around this axis from theta equals zero to theta equals pi divided by two. Now, if we draw a quick little sketch of this polar equation, r equals six times cosine theta is also a circle, but it is located in a different place in our polar coordinate system. So if I draw that here, this is our angle of zero, angle of pi divided by two, an angle of pi and three pi divided by two. The circle represented by r equals six times cosine theta will be located on the right side of the vertical axis and it's split by the polar axis. All right, and in this case, we're just looking at this circle or this curve from an angle of zero to an angle of pi divided by two. So that's going to take us from this angle right here to this angle. So that's only going to be half of our circle. All right, so this part of the circle right here, this half of the circle, this arc length, is what we are revolving around the vertical axis, this axis right here, to form a surface of revolution. All right, and so I'm just gonna label that. This is the axis that we are revolving around. Okay, so now let's work on setting up our definite integral to calculate the area of this surface of revolution. Since we are revolving around the vertical axis, our formula is going to change a little bit from our previous example. So here's what we're going to have. The area of the surface of revolution will be equal to two pi times the integral from alpha to beta of r times cosine theta, this is what's different. In the previous example, we had r times sine theta because we were revolving around the polar axis, but in this case, we're revolving around theta equals pi divided by two, so we have r times cosine theta instead. And then we're multiplying by the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared d theta. Now we have our bounds of integration, alpha and beta are zero and pi divided by two, and we know what r is equal to. It's six times cosine theta, the only thing that we don't have is dr d theta, the derivative of r with respect to theta. And so let's find that. dr d theta will be equal to the derivative of six times cosine theta, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so dr d theta will be negative six times sine theta. All right, and so now we have everything that we need to set up this definite integral and calculate the area of our surface of revolution. So let's plug everything in. This will be equal to two pi, times the integral from zero to pi divided by two, right? Those are the two angles of theta that our curve lies between that we were revolving around our axis. And then we're going to have r times cosine theta and r is equal to six times cosine theta. So we'll have six times cosine theta times cosine theta times the square root of r squared. Once again, r is equal to six times cosine theta. So we'll have six times cosine theta squared plus dr d theta squared, and dr d theta is equal to negative six times sine theta, but this isn't our way, so I'm gonna rewrite it up here. dr d theta is equal to negative six times sine theta. All right, so I just rewrote that. Now, let's write it in here. Underneath the square root, we will have negative six times sine theta squared times d theta. Okay, so now our definite integral is set up. Now we just have to simplify it and then solve it. First thing I notice is that we have two cosine thetas here being multiplied by each other. So we'll have cosine squared theta. So this will be equal to two pi times the integral from zero to pi divided by two of six times cosine squared theta. And then underneath this square root, we can square each of these quantities. Six times cosine theta squared will be 36 cosine squared theta and negative six times sine theta squared will be positive 36 times sine squared theta. So we'll have the square root of 36 times cosine squared theta plus 36 times sine squared theta, and then don't forget to write d theta. Okay, so now I'm going to pull this six to the outside. So we'll have six times two pi, which is 12 pi. So this is equal to 12 pi times the integral from zero to pi divided by two 
and then we'll still have cosine squared theta. But then underneath this square root, notice that we have a common factor of 36 in each of these terms. So if we pull that 36 out, we'll have the square root of 36 times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And then we still have d theta on the end. All right, so now by doing that, by pulling 36 out of each of these terms, we're just left with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which should look pretty familiar. We simplified this same exact expression in our previous example. We know from our Pythagorean identity for sine and cosine that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one. So what we really have here within this integral is the square root of 36 times one, which is just the square root of 36, which we know to be six. And so this whole square root just reduces to a value of six that we can pull out to the front. We can have six times 12 pi, and then on the inside of the integral, we'll just have cosine squared theta times d theta. All right, so this whole quantity right here just becomes six. All right, so this will be equal to that six times 12 pi. We're pulling it out to the front of the integral, and six times 12 is 72. So we'll have 72 pi times the integral from zero to pi divided by two of cosine squared theta d theta. All right, and so now we have a fairly simple trigonometric integral that we know how to solve. All we're left with is cosine squared theta within our integral, which we know how to integrate by rewriting it using a half angle identity. In particular, we know that cosine squared theta is equal to one half times one plus cosine of two theta. So if we rewrite cosine squared theta using this identity, then we will be able to integrate and solve for our area of the surface of revolution. So this will be equal to 72 pi times the integral from zero to pi divided by two of one half times one plus cosine of two theta d theta. All right, and then we can pull this one half to the outside. We'll have one half times 72 pi and 72 times one half is 36. So this will be equal to 36 pi times the integral from zero to pi divided by two of one plus cosine of two theta d theta. Now at this point, we're going to want to split this integral up into two integrals, one for each term. We can integrate one pretty easily, but cosine of two theta is going to require the use of u substitution. We have a composite function where the inside function is two theta and the outside function is cosine. So we need to set u equal to that inside function and then use the u substitution process. All right, so if we split this integral up into two integrals, we will have 36 pi times the integral from zero to pi divided by two of one d theta plus 36 pi times the integral from zero to pi divided by two of cosine of two theta d theta. Now we can use u substitution for this integral in order to solve it. We'll set u equal to two theta. And so du d theta, the derivative of u with respect to theta is equal to two. And then multiplying both sides by d theta will give us du is equal to two times d theta. And then whatever du is equal to needs to be found within our integral. Now, just like with our previous example, I don't see two d theta in our integral. I just see d theta. So we need to divide both sides by two and find that du divided by two is equal to d theta, which is a term of du that is equal to something that we can find within our integral. All right, so now we can rewrite this integral in terms of u. But before we do that, let's integrate this integral. The integral of one is theta. So this is equal to 36 pi times theta evaluated from zero to pi divided by two. And then we'll add that to 36 pi times the integral. And I'm gonna rewrite these bounds of integration in terms of u in just a second. But first let's rewrite everything else in terms of u. We'll have cosine of u times du divided by two. And then for the bounds of integration, we'll plug these values of theta into our equation for what we set u equal to. So we'll have u equals two times theta. For our lower bound, theta is zero. So we'll have two times zero, which is zero. So u equals zero will be the new lower bound. So we'll still have zero. And then for the upper bound of pi divided by two, we'll have two times pi divided by two, which is pi. So the new upper bound will be u equals pi. So now we have our integral entirely in terms of u. And so now we can integrate and solve pretty easily. And so let's do that. First, let's evaluate theta at pi divided by two and subtract the evaluation at zero. 
So that will look like this. We'll have 36 pi times pi divided by two minus zero. And then that will be added to this integral, but I'm gonna pull this one half to the outside. So we'll have one half times 36 pi, and 36 divided by two is 18. So we'll have 18 pi times the integral of cosine u, and the integral of cosine is sine. So we'll have sine u evaluated from zero to pi. And then to simplify further, we have 36 pi times pi divided by two minus zero. This is just pi divided by two, so this is equal to 36 pi times pi divided by two plus 18 pi times sine of u evaluated at pi minus the evaluation at zero. But sine of pi and sine of zero are both zero. So we'll have zero minus zero, which is zero, and then zero times 18 pi, which is also zero. So this whole term just becomes zero. So we're adding zero to 36 pi times pi divided by two. And so finally, we get our final answer of 36 pi times pi divided by two. 36 divided by two is 18. And so we'll have 18 times pi squared, right? These two pi's multiplied together will be pi squared. And so 18 pi squared is the area of the surface of revolution formed by revolving half of this circle represented by r equals six cosine theta around the vertical axis theta equals pi divided by two. Okay, so this was our last example for this lesson video, but if you wanna see some more examples, feel free to check out my examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments, but if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now, so I will see you next time.